So I finally got around to Animaniacs. I had no idea what I was getting into. I decided not, not to watch much of the earlier series to really sink in my teeth as a newer viewer to see if this works as a show, but more importantly, as a reboot. <laughs> Over the course of hours of binge watching this show, it taught me a lot about what a good reboot can do. When you hear that a big media corporation is going to take an older property, particularly one that had a good reputation, and introduce new staff, new culture, and a new perspective on the property, it's completely within your right to worry. There's a wide variety of reactions to when a reboot is announced. You have the people who are hyped and excited, usually casual fans who either don't keep up with the network or just really love animation. You have the people who are critical or negative towards it, generally protective of the show. Yes, the shows they don't own, but possibly also critical or dissatisfied with the current state of networks or animation itself. But I've always been in the third category. Ask me again when I see it. I remember back when I made the Thundercats Roar video, when it had a trailer, I saw it, it didn't look amazing, but it didn't look terrible. So the sentiment of that video back when I made it was basically, ask me again when I see it. Here, I made an Animaniacs video back in November of 2020, and while optimistic for it, given its direction to stick closely to the source material, my sentiment is the same, it will always be the same with new properties, ask me again when I see it. To explain why I feel like that's almost always the best course of action, let's go through the episode. We see what many people would have seen if they saw one of the two videos that were available as far as new Animaniacs content that was on YouTube. The Warner Bros crew meeting up with Steven Spielberg, creator of the show, and in charge of the reboot, bringing the zany, wacky trio to life. Helen, this species of cartoon has been extinct since 1998. I mean, these haven't been seen on TV since the golden era of animation. And... and... What? The animation here has this stiff, jagged, uneasy feel to exaggerate the movement of these characters given a modern spin to an old school cartoony feel. They squash and stretch a lot like other cartoons, but in a heightened way where the distance between point A to point B is further dramatized, and I love it. I also just love the dynamic between the two. They're in awe, but not to a self-serving degree where it feels like the show is patting itself on the back. Not to say that they don't dip into that, but it's definitely not within this segment of this episode. It's a neat reference to exactly what you think it is, and the way that they bounce onto the screen really emphasizes the way that they are elegant and the way that they decide to be cartoons. Cartoony. I also just love the sun rays, it gives this very angelic feel, it shows that they had an end goal for this, to really amp up the return of a beloved series, and as I said back then, it was loved then, both in the comments and with myself, and it's loved now. Clean vectored outlines, widescreen format. These don't look like reruns. Uh, well, uh, they're not. <laughs> I reanimated them. We are gonna make a fortune with this show. Also, I know what the show used to do back in the day, but it's weird to see a not made for adult show reference the real world very openly and blatantly. Like, yeah, we would get that in Family Guy or Rick and Morty or South Park, but these are all shows that are for adult audiences. I would have had a massive amount of respect for Teen Titans Go if they had a CN rep or Warner rep say that very same line. However, more on the money motivated actions later. It's a feel good moment to set the tone and mood that this first episode at the very least will be celebratory, which great, awesome. I should also say something before I go further. I love music. In fact, I spent a lot of December while I was on break working on things. Working on music. Listening to things. Listening to music. <laughs> studying things. Studying music. Getting lessons, all of that jazz. I love music. I can go on and on about all of the stuff that I like. And my point is that I don't like musical numbers. I didn't care much for when Steven Universe did it, or when Disney has done it. Plays, musicals in general, I know everybody and their mother has recommended the Spongebob musical, but I don't like musicals. It's always, historically, been a drag for me. Even here, with the theme song, it feels like a drag. It doesn't move me in the way that it would someone who actually enjoys musicals or enjoys musical numbers. So with that, if I seem less interested in the musical parts of this episode, which were a lot, it's not a knock on a show, but a clash between personal preferences. 
All right, guys, there's a lot of pressure on our first lines. They gotta be funny, they gotta be irreverent, and most of all, they gotta be carefully crafted. But you just wasted yours on. All right, guys, there's a lot of pressure on our first lines. Let's talk about meta humor. You would think for a channel like mine that loves Gumball, loves Chowder, loves Rick and Morty, that I would be a big fan of meta humor. If anyone wanted that tit mouse Deadpool animated show the most, it was me. However, meta humor is an interesting tool in the writer's toolbox because unlike other forms of humor, the meta aspect has to acknowledge certain things about the show and thus the critiques are different. When a show like SpongeBob has a poor joke or an episode that you didn't find funny at the very least, the writers were attempting to write a funny episode that is within a universe. Here, because they acknowledge their existence as a reboot, they have more liberty as to what they say. But so do I. The second part of meta humor is humor. And while I do think that the first joke was very good, I can't say that about every single one in this episode, and I feel like a meta joke flubbing is even worse than a regular joke flubbing. Wait, don't! Make sure it's good first. Yeah, it's all on you, Dot. Maybe something reminiscent of the first season? But modern to show that we're not your dad's animaniacs. But not so modern that you'll alienate the dads because they're a key part of our demographic. It was a neat running joke, and I'd even go as far as to say a smart choice in picking this to be the running joke. Having all of the new characters that are not pinky in the brain go through this first line thing, it's actually pretty entertaining. Of course, this ends with the Warner sister, Dot, having the last word, being equally as cartoony but serving as a much needed contrast to her fast talking, wise cracking Warner Brothers. However, that phrase, not your dad's Animaniacs. I suppose what they mean here is to not solely rely on their old values and philosophy and jokes in creating this modern, widescreen, clean vector version of the show. Keep that in mind. So for this first episode, at least on the Animaniacs end, there really isn't much of a plot. This is what I mean about that whole patting themselves on the back, self-serving sort of look when it comes to the first episode. Rather than naturally introducing these new characters through new adventures, this first episode, this second segment, honestly felt more like an animated vlog than an episode that I should care about. As an animation reviewer, I have to on some level enjoy animation of course, but if I were a child who wants to watch this version of Animaniacs, maybe I've heard it or I've seen it before, maybe I have Hulu and it's been recommended. Seeing that in that scenario I wouldn't know what this show is about, the following scenes just look like a whole lot of nothing. They go towards their home within the water tower, Wacko grabs a sandwich, they meet Ralph T. Guard, and the new CEO, Norita Norita. It's super straightforward. However, it doesn't really show me anything that a normal adventure would have, and that's kind of the issue. You could say that just seeing and experiencing the new studios alongside the Wacky Trio is good enough for you, but at some level you would have to agree that you would be waiving some level of expectation that you would give any other animated show purely because you love these characters, you want to see these characters characters you want to see this show, it's a reboot of a show that you may have liked before. And hmm, didn't they talk about not being your dad's Animaniacs? It seems like they're leaning pretty heavily on their prestige in order to not really have much of anything else to say or do in this episode. trip the alarm after that elaborate laser dance? What lasers? That was my sandwich dance. <laughs> And this isn't to say that they aren't funny at times, which this is clearly in my alley of humor, but like, how, how can I explain this? It's like the section of you that love face reveals, and that would want one from me. You would most likely agree that if you did want a face reveal from me, that you wouldn't really care what video it is. It could be its own separate video, it could be a subscriber milestone, it could be a Q&A. Hell, I could randomly just start including a face cam within a video, just out of the blue. And if your goal was just to see what I look like, then the actual content that comes with that is irrelevant, because that's not what you're going into that video for. That is how I feel about how this episode handled itself. Because more people would be just excited to see the characters, it didn't really matter what they did, provided that they stuck closely to the source material, which they already showed that they were doing, and their personalities. But as a new viewer, 
I felt like it kind of lacked a bit, given that the show is known for having clever writing, great personalities, memorable skits, and everything else that you would contribute to this show. Maybe I expected more than I should have to an extent, but wouldn't you? One of the biggest games of 2020, Cyberpunk 2077, was marketed spectacularly regardless of the actual game's quality. I'm sure the people who pre-ordered the game had some base level of expectations, given the material they got to see before it came out. Also, if they can pull the meta card, so can I. I'm a reviewer by trade, so I would at least have to have some base level of expectations to discuss my unique point of view towards the show, especially given that I already made a video that I was looking forward to the reboot. Naturally, I would be looking forward to the show for a reason, and this episode hit the mark in some ways, but unfortunately not with the main trio. If there were a tier list ranking for this season, this episode maybe it would have gotten a solid A, maybe even the highest B. It's to say that it was really, really good, but it wasn't perfect, and it wasn't even really that phenomenal. Because if I were to say that, it would be an embellishment personally, because even though the jokes and a lot of the dialogue was top tier, I can't help but feel like a lot of that was put into an empty vacuum, an empty vehicle, that when you look back at it, it's actually not really that good of an episode. <laughs> Gotcha! What is that thing? I, it's a, I, a, a clone. No, I, a, a phone. I, no, a drone. That's it, it's a drone. Hey! What would I do differently with this episode, especially with this first episode? Well, given what I have here, why not it revolve around them going into the water tower? It's an iconic structure, it's their home, maybe it's worn down. Maybe it's locked. Maybe that entire area is closed and there's no way to get in. That way you can still introduce a guard and a CEO through a wacky adventure rather than a checklist. Plus, given the actual time spent focusing on the tower, you could throw in memories, more jokes on failed attempts going inside the tower, and really sell the idea that this is the grand Warner Water Tower of the Warner Brothers and Warner Sister. Oh, and speaking of CEO. All human knowledge in one easy to swallow tablet? Don't mind if I do. Hey, I'm the eating stuff guy. <laughs> Although a brief, slightly underwhelming appearance, they gained the knowledge of everything that happened when they ended in the 90s to now and they express this newfound knowledge through song. Even though I don't care much for musical numbers, I can't help but feel like this song is a bit too on the nose. It feels like you can find this song's lyrics in like the YouTube Rewind or something like that if it were to come out this year, if they did one this year. It just feels like it's kind of just there. It's like saying that 2020 was a dumpster fire in 2021. And even for a new show, when you're given the topic of parody and satire, you still have to make a point. And when you're making that point, it kind of helps if you make a unique one, even if it's ridicule. This feels like you just took a Wikipedia article and ran it through a musical generator, then polished some parts up. I understand that your demographic is kids or the father of said kids. Anywho, timeless writing generally has a point to make. And if I were to accept that this show has clever writing, it can't rely on cliches just because people expect it to make modern versions of old jokes. It's kind of pandering. You see, the writers are writing this in 2018. How is that possible? The people rely on anime rights for outrageous and relevant content. Well, how can we finish catching up when we don't know what happened in the last two years? I don't know, wild guesses? So, when you see the trio say that they're going to predict things from the future in this section of the song, you would expect for this to be the opportunity for them to say something funny, poignant, clever, or a jab at something. They say we get chips in our brains, we live on the ground, we breed chickens with our arms, we send humans to Mars, and natural disasters will become more destructive. I can't help but think that I see this exact same sentiment on Twitter on a daily basis. Did I really need to hear it in an animated reboot that people loved and have it take two years to prepare? Probably not. However, we get to the significantly better, more witty, more relevant, more entertaining portion with Pinky and the Brain. We get a dark atmosphere as we meet the two rodents who took over the world by storm, simply by one of them wanting to take over the world by storm. Gee, Brian, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. 
Of all of the segments within this episode, this was my favorite. The theme song of the duo was to the point, very reminiscent of the old theme but with a fresh coat of paint. Plus, the premise here is modern enough to be considered fresh without pandering or failing to grasp that level of nuance that you would see dropped with the main trio. Pinky is watching a show that focuses on animals doing silly things, laughing at what Brain sees as dumb, mindless entertainment. I do appreciate how it's a show that fits well within its time period, the show in which the host goes through funny home recordings. It's like the funniest home videos of America. They should really make a show like that. I wonder what you would call it. Upon seeing the influence it has on Pinky, Brain gets an idea, specifically a 20 year idea to influence the world with the internet. Now the plan here is very murky because the intention is that Brain would create a filter on an app that will control the minds of everyone under the guise of it being just another photo of an animal. However, it shows this with a montage and within it, the quote age of the internet is born. Did Brain invent the internet? Did Brain invent the app? All of this is an attempt to get onto the show, but was the app available in the 1990s? Is this show still running for over a decade and change? Did he have any other plans to take over the world in the 20 year time frame, but he didn't do it because he was so banked on this idea? The answer is to most likely not think about it, but all of this could have been avoided by just assuming that it's 2018, modern day, and then have Brain do this idea. But the montage ruins all immersion for that by creating this giant inconsistency and not answering any questions. I've spent the last 22 years undergoing rigorous psychotherapy and realized that our codependent relationship isn't based on a shared desire to conquer the world, but rather my enabling of your systematic emotional and physical abuse. Quiet, you nincompoop. Righto, <laughs> I deserve that. I love how they drop this in so nonchalantly. It gives off this different meta feel that I don't see a lot of other shows tackle. While somewhat as meta as their animated counterparts on the other half of this episode, what I enjoy about when Pinky and the Brain introduce meta is that it doesn't seem to be compensating for actual dialogue or adventure. It seems natural, or at the very least funny enough that it doesn't even matter if they reach for this card more often than your average cartoon. The internet is the most powerful information sharing tool ever devised. And do you know what most humans use it for? I do, but I don't think I can say it. Did I mention how naturally witty this segment is compared to the other? Also, Pinky, you can say it. The internet is largely used to discuss whether I'm a furry or not, to which I humbly reply, no comment. Speaking of natural, this pair of premise and characters is a match made in heaven. Why wouldn't Brain harvest the power of the internet? It's where your attention is. Yes, you, watching this from a place that requires a constant internet connection. It's a modern take on a classic character's motivations. He plans to throw this filter onto a video of himself, taking over the brains of humans everywhere by taking advantage of the fact that he can qualify as a cute animal that humans would spend their time on. The filter aspect doesn't seem corny because it fits directly within the story they plan to tell. Even if you would associate apps and filters and animal videos to be a little passe for 2020 or even 2018. So Brain gets into a baby costume and makes a video so not cute that the World Wildlife Fund wouldn't want to protect them. In fact, I'm pretty sure that PETA blocked him on Instagram due to this video. Oh, I'm sorry, Insta gratification. However, it doesn't matter because on this Insta gratification IG app that can tag the entire world, even those without phones, he has the mind control filter built in and thus anyone who sees this video will now see the mind control filter. It's genius, except it doesn't work. However, due to Brain learning of the only other type of video that actually does well on any platform, besides Finger Family videos and Among Us videos, Pinky uploads a video of Brain getting hurt, which garners millions of likes. In fact, it spreads so fast that he's now on the late night show that he inadvertently wanted to be on, given that it's not the same show that would inspire him to do so in the first place 20 years ago. You're Himalaya's mouse, right? Of course, it is I, the brain. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, I remember that meme. Classic. Listen, Mr. Myers appreciates you coming by, but unfortunately we've had to bump you. Bump me? For who? Oh, okay, so his name is Business Pig. You know, the pig who made the New York Swine's top boars under four. However, here is where we get the part that I love the most, for many reasons. As you can see here, Brain would be dumped from the show after taking the world by storm for another animal who did the same thing, just a little later than when he did. 
This to me is actual smart writing because it goes through the life cycle of memes and viral moments in which you would expect them to be what sends you into superstardom. However, a lot of times you would be a flash in the pan. It discusses the idea of being viral without actively pointing at it, rather going through the adventure through the lens of what you would expect Pinky and the Brain to be about. I also do enjoy how Brain doesn't know this because he's adjusting to this new time. All he saw was the future of being cemented as an internet meme. I love how this segment comes together because it's fresh for the time without becoming dated because the general concept is as old as time. Memes may be something that you would know of recently in the grand scope of the world, but the concept of being popular one day and then not being popular and then another person taking your spot is actually rather common. It's been old as the concept of the mainstream being around. Not everything lasts, and in fact, it is those flash in the pan moments throughout a year that makes things seem lively, when it's only 20% of those popular moments actually having a lasting connection with you. This is why this is better than the main segment, because it actually had a point. Not a new point, or even a fresh point, but a point that it wanted to make without going social media bad, reboots bad, memes good. It was actually articulate, and that's what made me enjoy it. That's why I love this part a lot more than the other part. However, this does have some drawbacks. Hey, I know that pig. I just shared a video of him this morning. Pinky, you puerile pustule. You used my mind control filter! Now, I'm not saying that having Pinky ruins the plans, ruins the episode, or even that it's a bad thing, but I do feel like if there was no mind control filter, but just another person posting a video, the message would have been stronger to emphasize the point that everyone is trying to get their 15 seconds of fame. And even though Brain prides himself as a genius, this is a very competitive and saturated atmosphere, especially for the 2010s. By having it all end because of a mind control filter being re applied, why couldn't Brain just do this again? It's already built into the app. It kind of makes Brain look stupid for sticking to the status quo of not taking over the world, when all you have to do is just watch your phone this time. I do want to reiterate, this criticism is not enough for me to not like the segment. I love this segment. I think this segment is what makes me put this in the B to A ranking alone. It's just my personal preference on what would have made this a tad better. Of course they get kicked out, and Brain rightfully decks Pinky for messing up his plans, but in in the classic Pinky and the Brain fashion, they begin planning for their next idea to take over the world. We get back to the main trio, who see that more shows than them are getting rebooted. They have these staff members explain what rebooting means to the audience, and they sing a song. I bet I could sing a bitingly satirical song about it. Didn't we just do that right before Pinky and the Brain? Uh uh uh. We're also part of the Age of Reboots, sis. We gotta do it again. Granted, this song is much better than the first song. It also runs into the issue of not really doing anything other than telling me what I knew before going into the episode. Yes, reboots are not original properties, and Hollywood is doing a lot of them. You don't really seem to have that much issue with it if you're willing to discuss it in your first episode back. That'd be like me making a video, hating on how people cling on to shows for their video topics within the cartoon community, and then dropping a 10-part series talking about the best episodes of The Amazing Grid of Gumball. Which I am doing, just with Without the hate, coming soon, or already out. Just because you're self-aware that you're going to be doing a thing or that you're also doing a thing doesn't automatically nullify the hypocrisy for poking fun at it. I'm sorry, but the Animaniacs isn't cool enough to overlook being hypocrites here. Also, this is 90% of this second segment. It's just this song about reboots. And musically, it's fine. I think the rhymes flow effortlessly into each other. It sounds great. The animation is nice. They bring up a lot of shows that have come back. They don't really say much other than it's a shameless cash grab and it's only done for a guaranteed rating smash and basically everything that everyone already says about reboots. Like I said within the first part, if I am to believe that this is smart writing, saying things that people have said when Teen Titans Go were coming out, or even before then, I'm pretty sure with Lunatics Unleashed, probably even before then with 2003 TMNT, probably even before that with Pinky Elmira and the Brain, probably even before that with the Hanna-Barbera stuff in the 80s, and probably even before that, you get the point. You have to say something new or in a fresh way. If you already believe this sentiment that reboots are shameless or a 
cash grab or you already agree with the jokes that they're making here, then besides this being the Animaniacs, what does this song really do for you? If I were to say that the YouTube copyright system is broken and make a funny video about it, is that video really for you? No, it's the ridicule. Parody and satire generally is made for the other side as well. How would this convince people who don't think reboots are shameless of anything? It's quite a pander, and as someone who's a panda, I'm tangentially aware of how pandering works. And I'm also a YouTuber, and when you get to 100k, they make you take a course in pandering. I think I got a C plus in it. Anywho, we get a statement from the trio. Have you no shame? Here's your check for the Animaniacs reboot, you sellouts. Yeah, but when we sell out, we know we're selling out, so it's cool. In the wise words of Franklin from GTA 5, What? No, you're not cool. In fact, if you either buried Hulu, which would show that you don't care and it is truly about the money, so it actually would be legitimately cool, that would actually make you cool. If Family Guy can do it with Fox, I'm pretty sure you can do it with Hulu. You can also be about the money without calling other reboots soulless. That way you can be self-aware, but you don't have to pretend that you're making it work because you're not. Or just blow people away. Even if you thought this episode was good, which I do, I didn't think that it blew me away because it's far too late and the episode acknowledges that. But rather than doing what they did with Pinky and the Brain by acknowledging that certain themes do repeat over the course of time just with a new coat of paint, they lean on their legacy and basically tell you things that you already know. Be honest, if this were a new show with three characters who wanted to tell you that reboots are soulless, if this was a new satire or parody show and it was telling you that the world is getting worse and, and just in certain aspects they just told you things that you already have seen before, would you enjoy it as much if it didn't have the Animaniacs care package behind it? I don't think most people would. You're literally taking a big fat dump where you eat by making episodes like this. And honestly, just as a first time viewer, when I watched this for the first time, I was just looking forward to the next episodes and I hope that they got past that. Again, to reiterate, I'm not saying that this episode was bad. Like I said, I would put it in the B's, maybe the A's. It was a good episode. It had a lot of good moments, but a lot of that really comes from the Jurassic Park clip and the pinky and the brain parts. It doesn't necessarily come from the main trio. As someone who was looking forward and was behind the hype of this beloved series and saw clips and have seen some episodes from it and fell in love with Pinky and the Brain even back in the day, this just wasn't a good episode to justify them being as soulless as they describe remakes and reboots. And well, if we're gonna monetize ourselves, I might as well get into it as well. Make sure to check out the merch at alphaj.show slash merch. Get yourself a nice hoodie, a shirt, a poster. This episode was good, not for Phenomenal, not perfect, but good. The Pinky and the Brain bits were the best segment out of all four, and I would recommend at least to try it out before casting judgments. This is how Animaniacs ends the hate for reboots in 22 minutes. Well, until the next video, thank you so much for your time. Take care. Alpha out.